equipment. So we're going to need our vertical milling machine. We're going to need a cutter. In this case, I have a carbide insert shell cutter. We need a properly aligned device. And obviously, we need some blank parts. So we have our two blocks, and they're almost identical. They're about the same size, and they're of the same material. This is 4140 medium carbon steel. What is different, however, is this first block on the right here is a cold rolled piece of medium carbon steel, and this second one here is hot rolled. So our first block, the cold rolled medium carbon steel block, well, it has certain particularities. Now since it's cold rolled, its surfaces are quite clean and quite flat and its shape and size is quite accurate. So this piece of cold rolled steel on the surfaces that were rolled or laminated is quite accurate, flat and square. The only part of this cold rolled piece of steel that isn't really accurate are the two ends because those are the parts that were cut on the bandsaw. Our second part, the hot roll piece of 4140 medium carbon steel, well, its surfaces aren't very pretty at all. As you can see, they're quite rough, and its outside shape isn't very accurate either. So this part is slightly oversized as well to permit its finishing at its basic size. So these are one by two bars in both cases. This first cold roll part is about a thousandth or two thousandths of an inch oversized, so quite accurately one by two. But this second one is ten, sometimes fifteen thousandths of an inch oversized, and that way we can finish it to a one by two a sectional part. Now, this block, the hot rolled one, is going to require a lot more work to square it up. Since we're talking about squaring up, we might as well clarify what squaring up means. And to square up a block, we have to perform two separate activities simultaneously. The first activity is to ensure that all the pair of surfaces, so the pair of primary surfaces, the pair of secondary surfaces, and the pair of tertiary surfaces are all parallel. So this primary surface parallel to that primary surface. And once all these surfaces are parallel, the second thing we want to have a squared up block is that each surface, each of the eight surfaces on the block are square or at a 90 degree angle to all the adjoining surfaces on the block. Our piece of cold roll 4140 well, if we look at it, it presents to us four good surfaces. The primary and the secondary surfaces are already flat, parallel, and square to each other. The only thing we really have to do is finish the two ends that were cut on the saw. But be careful. Even though these primary and secondary surfaces are good and accurate, there can still be bumps and imperfections on them. So once you've deburred the part, File quite lightly, just on the surface, to see if there's any bumps that need to be removed before you move on to the actual squaring up of the two ends. The hot rolled 4140 block, however, is a whole other can of beans because it has six surfaces that are rough and not accurate. And that means that we're going to have to machine each one of the surfaces. And to manage to get this quite inaccurate block good and square, well, we're going to have to follow a very precise sequence of operations. And remember, square doesn't happen by chance. You have to purposely square up a part. If you just put a piece in the vise and hope that it's going to end up square, well, that's wishful thinking. It's just probably not going to happen. You have to follow a very precise sequence. So, let's take a look at how to square up this hot rolled piece of 4140 steel. We're going to do this one first because it's really the worst case scenario. None of these surfaces are good, so we're really going to have to start from scratch.
Now, the first step in any squaring up operation is going to be deburring the part. Well, even on the cold roll part, we're going to want to deburr it and take off all of the burrs that were produced by the cutoff operation. But this hot roll part requires a little more work before we can start squaring up. And it's a good idea to remove all the scale that we can on the surface of this part before we start machining. The scale is quite hard and it can wear out a cutter a little more rapidly. Also, it doesn't sit as well on the vise jaws. So let's try and remove it. I suggest a very coarse stone, or if you don't want to waste money, use an old grinding stone that's too small for your machine. And just get rid of all that scale. We can see here that I've cleaned my first primary surface and both of my secondary surfaces. I haven't cleaned the second primary because that's the one we're going to cut and it will become the reference surface for all the other surfaces. Now I haven't cleaned my tertiary surfaces because they were cut with the bandsaw and have no scale on them. Now the primary surface, the largest of the pairs of surfaces, but that primary surface that we haven't cleaned up uh, with our abrasive, well that is going to be the first surface that we're going to cut. So the primary that has cleaned up, well it's going to be sitting on parallels in the vise and we're going to cut this first cut on our primary surface. It's always best to start by producing a flat primary surface and then all the other surfaces will come from that primary reference and that will ensure that we can get the part good and square. Normally, if I had a good flat and well finished part with parallel surfaces, all I'd have to do would be deposit in the vise and tighten the vise down to ensure that the part is properly held. But I have a problem here. The 4140 hot rolled steel block that I'm using here is not very square and is not well finished and I can clearly see that when I put it on a flat surface it doesn't sit true and it actually moves around because the surface, the secondary surface on which it's resting isn't flat and that is a problem. I'm going to have to find a solution that will help me hold it in the vise and get a good contact between the jaws and the part. And for that we're going to do something a little different. We're going to add an extra pair of shorter parallels and we're going to open the vise a little bit more. This vise opening is going to permit the insertion of small brass or mild steel cylinders that will help ensure that we get good contact between the part and the vise jaw. So another parallel and a third small brass or mild steel cylinder. These three cylinders will ensure that the pressure applied on the part is well distributed and that our movable jaw applies its force equally on the fixed jaw of the vise. One of the main problems with squaring up here is the block isn't in good shape. It has no good flat surfaces and we're going to have to produce a good flat surface on that primary that's going to become our reference. And to do that, we have to hold it in the vise on our secondary surfaces. And that's problematic. Because if I look at our part, and I imagine that it's going to be held in a vise, movable jaw, and my fixed jaw. If this movable jaw applies a force on this part that is irregular in shape, it doesn't have a nice flat surface, there's no guarantee that the force that I apply on the part is going to be spread out across the whole of the secondary surface. This may very well just touch on one point here and one point there, I don't know and really not hold the part very well. To ensure that we get good contact and an even dispersal of the holding force, we're going to use cylindrical 
its sleeves. And for that, we're going to put a piece of brass, in this case, or mild steel, with one piece of steel at this end. It's just a little piece of half inch or three quarter inch bar stock, uh, brass half hard. And on the other side, we're going to put two more. So one here and two here. This is the side that has the force applied to it, and this ensures that the force from here is going to be spread out evenly over the whole of the secondary surface that comes up to my fixed jaw on the vise, and that this will be a stable way of holding the part for this first cut. Very important. I can see that we have our three contact points, and that's going to stabilize the part, but a few things still need to be said. The cylinders that we choose, these three, have to be of a material that is softer than the vice jaws and softer than the part we're holding. I've chosen half hard brass here, but I could have also used a free machining mild steel. But be very careful. We don't want to use hardened steel or hard materials. We don't want the part to roll between these as if they were rollers. These cylinders will hold the part better if they are slightly crushed by the tightening of the vise. Equally important is the height of the parallels that I've chosen. The two parallels that I've chosen to support my part have a height that permits the part, or the surface I'm going to cut, to just sit proud of the top of the vice jaws. My part here sticks out by about a hundred thousandths of an inch. It's important because everything that isn't in the vise acts as a lever and increases the strain during a cutting operation. And that's something we want to avoid. The parallels that I've chosen to support the cylinders, well, they're of a height that permits the cylinders to sit just flush with the top of the vice jaws. And this will ensure that they won't come in interference with the top of the part while I'm cutting it and still ensure a maximum contact between the cylinders and the part. I can now tighten down my vise and using a dead blow hammer seat the part as well as possible against those two parallels. Don't expect miracles. The bottom surface isn't really flat, so full contact is probably not going to happen. We're now ready for our first cut. We're going to bring our rotating tool up to the surface of the part, just, just barely rubbing it. Then I'm going to set my Z axis to zero because it's important to know where you're starting from. Then I'm going to back the tool off in X come down about 10 or 15 thousandths of an inch. That'll be just enough, or should be just enough, to clean up the surface of the part. It's important to remember that the objective here is just to get this surface flat. It's the first surface we're cutting. You have to get used to removing the least amount of material as possible on your first cut, because everything you take off now won't be there for adjusting on the second side. And there you go. Our first surface is machined. We can see that it's well finished, good and flat. It'll be a perfect reference surface. We mustn't forget this surface becomes the reference for all my other surfaces. So the first cut is done. I can now 
once I've made sure that my emergency stop button is activated, pull the part from the vise and do what I have to do every time I machine the surface and move the part, that is remove the burrs that I've just produced. There, my first primary surface, my reference surface is complete. And for the rest of the next four surfaces, that primary surface is always going to be up against the fixed jaw of the vise. And that's going to help us ensure that the part will end up square. Now we're going to attack the secondary and tertiary surfaces uh, in this order. We're going to start with our reference surface up against the fixed jaw of the vise. I say it often because it's very important. We're going to start by cutting a first secondary. And once that is nice and flat, we're going to turn it, keeping our primary surface up against the fixed jaw, and set our second secondary surface parallel to the first. Then we're going to move on to our first tertiary side, and that one's going to be a little touchy, because it's a lot more difficult to do than the secondaries. And we're going to do it, and then again, keeping the primary up against the fixed jaw of the vise, turn the part and do our second tertiary. Once those four surfaces are done, we're going to come back to our primary surface, reference surface, and this time it's going to go downwards on a set of parallels, and we'll come and finish our second primary surface parallel to that first one. And our part at that point will be nice and square. All that our first primary surface had to be was flat. That's pretty easy, and we've just done that. But our first secondary surface is a little more difficult because it has to be two things. Our first secondary surface has to be flat, but it also has to be perpendicular to the primary surface. So two things that we have to achieve simultaneously. And for that, we're going to keep our primary up against our fixed jaw on the vise. It's the perpendicularity of the vise's fixed jaw that permits us to position our part in a way that our secondary surface will be nice and square to our primary surface. And for that, we're going to position our reference primary surface, the nice flat one, up against that fixed jaw, holding the part as deeply as possible in the vise for maximum stability and holding power. Here again, we're going to use a parallel and a brass cylinder to ensure that the force applied by the vise jaw be dispersed very evenly over the part and ensure that we have a perfect contact between the primary reference part and our fixed jaw. So let's tighten the vise. and seat the part as well as possible using a dead blow hammer. As we did with our first cut, we're going to come and skim the surface of the part, back the tool off in the x-axis, set our z-axis to zero, reset our z-axis to about a depth of 10 or 15 thousandths of an inch, and take that cut. So let's do it. With our safety switch activated, we always have to think about safety here. We can remove the part from the vise and deburr it. 
and move on to my second secondary surface. Now, since I haven't changed the height of the table, I know that the height is already set at about the right height for my second surface. All I'll have to do is make sure that everything is good and clean, because a chip under my part here could really screw up my squareness. Now I want to reinstall my part in the vise with my secondary reference in the bottom and my primary reference, that large surface, up against the fixed jaw. But before that, I'm going to bring the table back to the left side of the machine, since that's the side that I'm going to be cutting from, and set my Z to about a ten thousandths of an inch cut. I'm not really worried here about dimensions, because it's just a demonstration on squaring up. Obviously, if you were shooting for specific sizes, you'd have to be a little more attentive to how much you're taking off. So, reference towards the bottom, reference towards the fixed jaw, I can install my part and tighten everything down, still using that brass cylinder. Don't forget to seat the part with your dead blow hammer. And this time, since our secondary reference surface is flat, we're going to get good contact. And since we know that we're already about at the right height, I won't have to skim the part. All I have to do here is just raise the table by about ten thousandths of an inch. And there you go. Our second secondary surface is complete. And it was pretty easy to do because all it had to be was parallel to the first secondary or the secondary reference surface. So we have one primary, two secondaries, so we can move on to our tertiary surfaces. The tertiary is a little more complex because three things have to happen at the same time. Our first tertiary surface has to be flat. It has to be perpendicular to our primary surface, and the vice jaw is going to give us that. But it also has to be perpendicular to our secondary surfaces. And to get that second perpendicularity, we're going to have to adjust the part in the vise. We can start our tertiary surfaces by positioning the part in the vise so that my first tertiary surface points upwards. But we're going to position the part just slightly crooked in the vise. And we're going to position it as deeply as possible in the vise, but make sure that it doesn't touch the bottom. We won't be using parallels here, because we want to be able to adjust it slightly. And that means that my first tightening will be just light, because I want to be able to adjust the part to get that secondary surface, the reference one, perpendicular to the machine's table. And now, using a solid square, we can position the part vertically by comparing it to that square. And since we still have some adjusting to do, tighten the vise just a little more. Since we use the solid square, which is very accurate, to position the secondary surface vertically or perpendicular to the table, we can expect that if I take a cut on the tertiary surface, that it will be nice, flat, and square to that secondary reference. But be careful. The positioning that I've just performed is accurate, but not extremely accurate. 
For most jobs where squareness is important but not critical, this alignment should be enough. However, if you're looking for a very high degree of accuracy, we'll follow up on this first positioning with a second positioning. And for that second more accurate positioning, we're going to use a dial indicator. And that way we can get the part as square as possible. So let's take a look at that. So I have my dial indicator and I have my part. The dial is in contact with the side of the part and I'm going to indicate it over about a two inch distance. So let's do that. But be careful. Use the z-axis on the machine and avoid using the quill. I want the straightness of the machine to shine through and I don't want any misalignment of the quill to come and hamper the squareness of my part. I can see here that my indicator is a couple of lines out. I'm talking lines and not dimensions because my indicator isn't perpendicular to my surface, but it's still a comparative indication that my part can be adjusted a little more. The direction of the dial's movement indicates to me that the part is leaning slightly towards the dial indicator. So I'll adjust that very lightly and then I'll re-verify to ensure that I've corrected the problem. I've tightened the vise down final, really good and tight. I've moved the tool over the part and while in rotation I've skimmed the part. I backed off in X, took a depth of about ten thousandths of an inch, and I'm ready for my cut. My first tertiary surface being complete, I can now remove the part from the vise and, as always, deburr it. To get my second tertiary surface parallel to the first, I'm going to choose the smallest parallel that I can find. Just one parallel under the part at this point. And I'm going to put my reference tertiary surface down onto that parallel. It's important to use the smallest parallel you can find because you want the part to be held as deeply as possible into the vise. And then, still using that brass cylinder to distribute the force evenly, tighten down the vise. Good and tight. And then, as always, we're going to seat it with a dead blow hammer. All that's left to do is the second primary surface and for that I'll install my primary reference surface down upon two parallels. It's important here to use two parallels because the width of the part is greater than the height of contact between the fixed jaw and the part. So using just one parallel would be unstable. And since everything else is square, we can dispense with the brass cylinders. All that's left to do now is to take a light cut on this second primary surface and my block will be squared up. So I've pulled the part from the vise and, as always, I've deburred it. And using a square, I've checked and I can see that I have six good flat and square surfaces. So this operation was a success. So on that first hot roll piece of steel, we had to attack six separate surfaces.
because nothing was flat and nothing was square. But on this second example, we have a cold rolled piece of steel that has good flat and parallel primary surfaces and good flat and parallel secondary surfaces. Really the only surfaces that we really have to work on here are the tertiary surfaces because they were cut with a bandsaw. And if we wanted to, we could attack these tertiary surfaces as we did with the other block, just skipping all the first steps of that squaring up operation and just finishing with the tertiaries. But we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have this piece of cold rolled steel to show a different technique for squaring up the ends. Let's take a look at some of the differences between what we're doing on this cold roll block and what we've done on the hot roll block. This block has four good flat surfaces and these surfaces are perpendicular one to the other. And since we have four good surfaces, we'll be able to dispense with the brass cylinders as long as we don't hold the part only on one end or the other of the vise because that will skew the movable jaw of the vise and in that case you still need the brass cylinder. Whenever possible, hold your part in the center of the vise jaws. The second difference is that our first squaring up operation was bidimensional and that means that to be able to bruise a flat surface, the vise doesn't need to be well aligned. What we're doing on this second part is quite different. It's akin to notching and it's going to require a very, very well aligned vise. The third difference is the cutting tool itself. And instead of using a shell mill that can cut on its face and on its side, but that can't produce a vertical surface, we're going to be using a two flute end mill. This type of end mill will, on its side, produce a vertical surface because we want to produce a vertical surface that's very perpendicular to the table. We're going to start by choosing and installing two parallels that will position the part heightwise in a way that its top surface protrudes from the vice jaws by a little more than one thickness of a parallel. We can Tighten the vise and seat the part well against the parallels with a dead blow hammer. We can now come and mill a small notch on the end of the part, on this tertiary end. Not very deep, just enough to make a nice flat surface. Since the fixed jaw of this vise is very well lined up, and that we're going to cut this notch using the Y axis or the transverse axis, the surface that we're going to produce should end up very perpendicular to the secondary surface that's up against the fixed jaw of the vise. Using conventional milling, not climb milling here, we're going to come and produce our little notch and we're going to make sure that we don't hit the top of the vise jaws when we're doing it. All we need to do here is produce a notch that's just slightly wider than the width of one of the parallels. As we can see, we've produced a flat and true surface that is just slightly wider than the thickness of one of our parallels. And we can use that surface to sit the part on a parallel that's in the bottom of the vise. And that will ensure proper perpendicularity of the part and give me a good and square tertiary surface on the end once milled. The part has been deburred and I'm going to sit it on a parallel, but choose the smallest parallel possible 
because we want the part to sit in the vise as deeply as possible. We want to hold it solidly in place. So install your notch surface on the parallel ensuring its proper positioning. To avoid using those brass cylinders, position your part towards the center of the vise jaws and tighten everything down well. As we've been doing from the beginning, seat the part properly with a dead blow hammer. As you can see, I've returned to the carbide shell mill and I'm just going to take a light surface cut to clean up that first tertiary end. Now all that's left is to pull the part from the vise, deburr, turn it over, sit it back on a parallel and cut the second tertiary side. My block is squared up. So, two methods for squaring up blocks. One that works really just on the tertiary surfaces and the other that can be used from scratch. Now, you're going to use, depending on the part you have and how many good surfaces there are, one or the other from the beginning or from some midpoint. But why two methods? Because the second method we looked at seems more complex. We have to line up the vise a lot more accurately and we have to use a second type of cutter to notch the edge of the part. Well, you know, it's, it's true, it is more complex. And if I were doing only one part or a couple, the first method of using a solid square and indicating the surface to zero, the secondary surface to get my tertiary square, well, that would probably be my choice for one or two parts. But what if you had 50 parts to produce? Well, obviously, the notching would be a lot quicker because you'd avoid all that setup. You do the setup once, notch all your parts, and then they'd all be square. So really, you choose the method and the start point of the method depending on the part you have. Remember, squareness isn't something that happens by chance. You have to work at it. It's a bit like a good relationship. So, keep busy, keep safe, and to everyone, happy machining.